theistic evolution critique, historical Christian doctrine. We've been going through the book, we're almost through it. Theistic evolution, a scientific, philosophical, and theological critique. As we've said many times before, this deals with how we treat creation um, and the life that we see around us. And uh, there are several options, the first one being young life creationism of various kinds. Another one being old earth creationism. Uh, it's actually old life, old earth, because there is a young life, old earth creationism. Then there is intelligent design theistic evolution. And uh, that is, it happens slowly, but you can tell that God was involved. Then there is non-intelligent design theistic evolution, and that is that you can't tell that God was involved, even though, in a sense, he was either by setting it up perfectly or by um, intervening in ways that we can't discover. And finally, of course, there is the idea that it looks natural because it is natural because there is no God to intervene at all. This book is not primarily intend, intended to discredit the latter hypothesis. It is more aimed at non-intelligent design theistic evolution. This uh, chapter is written by Greg Allison. And it is in section three, the biblical and theological critique of theistic evolution, and specifically the theological evolution, uh, theological critique. And it's entitled, Theistic Evolution is Incompatible with Historical Christian Doctrine. And uh, there is a one paragraph summary. Church leaders have historically been called upon to embrace and guard the orthodox position of the church on creation. This chapter develops the specific components of sound, sound doctrine in the area of creation. It articulates the church's historical perspective and demonstrates how theistic evolution is incompatible with a consensus viewpoint. It briefly discusses the views of several more recent evangelical writers. To begin, the thesis of this chapter is that theistic evolution is incompatible with doctrinal standards that have been required for church leadership as those doctrinal standards have been developed throughout church history. At the heart of this matter is the conviction that church leaders are required to embrace sound doctrine. In accordance with Paul's insistence for an elder, he must hold firm to the trustworthy words as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Church leaders must steadfastly cherish sound doctrine for themselves, be competent in communicating sound doctrine to others through preaching and teaching, and be able to expose and refute false doctrine and silence its purveyors. While it is certainly true that all Christians bear the responsibility to contend for the faith that was once delivered, once for all delivered to the saints, quoting Jude, th Jude 3, that grave duty falls especially on the shoulders of church leaders. Furthermore, as Jude notes, the sound doctrine that is enjoined on leaders today comports well with the historical faith of the church. Held to doctrinal standards and responsible for the teachings and defense of those sound doctrines, church leaders are called upon to embrace and guard the orthodox position on creation. So the idea is if you're going to be a church leader, you're stuck with the orthodox position, and then all we have to do is determine the orthodox position, and that's where you're going to come down. This chapter will develop the identity of that sound doctrine by articulating the church's historical perspective on creation and by demonstrating how theistic evolution is incompatible with this consensus viewpoint. The doctrinal standard on creation in the early church. The particular doctrinal standard that is at stake with regard to theistic evolution is the creedal affirmation on, or confessional statement in the first sentence of what is commonly known now commonly known as the Nicene Creed. Well, I, or we, believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. Explicit in this credo is monotheism, divine omnipotence and creation of all that exists, outside of God, of course, 
specifically the present world, but not limited to it, including all that is seen, that is dry land, seas, uh, vegetation, trees of all kinds, the sun and the moon, fish, sea creatures, birds, amphibians and reptiles and land mammals and human beings, according to Genesis 1, and all that is unseen, for example, angels. It is this belief that the church from its earliest days has confessed as being the truth in regard to creation. The phrase maker of heaven and earth is a clear echo of Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And the added specification that God is the maker of all things visible was uniformly understood in the early church to affirm God's direct cre creation of all the varieties of plants and animals on the earth. Yet this creedal affirmation contradicts the claim of theistic evolution that God was the maker only of the initial inanimate matter in the universe and that, that matter, apart from the divine guidance or intervention, is eventually developed by purely natural processes into all things visible. <clears throat> Certainly this early creed did not specifically address the issue of evolution in general or theistic evolution in particular. At the same time, it was not articulated in a vacuum. Indeed, it was formulated within a biblical theological framework and against philosophical theories that challenged the belief. Theologically, creation ex nihilo was affirmed over and against the Platonic idea of the eternality of matter. Tatian underscored matter is not like God without beginning or as having no beginning is of equal power with God. Rather, it is begotten and not produced by any other being, but brought into existence by the framer of all things alone. Theophilus reasoned, if God is uncreated and matter is uncreated, God is no, no longer according to the Platonist own thinking, the creator of all things, nor so far as their opinions hold is the monarchy, God is the first and only principle established. And what great thing is it if God made the world out of existing materials, for even a human artist, when he gets material from someone, makes out of it whatever he pleases. But the power of God is manifested in this, that out of things that are not, he makes whatever he pleases. Irenaeus expressed the church's belief in creation ex nihilo, explaining that God himself called into being the substance of creation when previously it had no existence. Undergirding this belief was the divine character. God is self-sufficient, therefore it cannot be said that God made the world for his own sake, since he can exist without the world as he did before it was made. Furthermore, he is omnipotent and wise. Indeed, the God of hosts, by his invisible and mighty power and his great wisdom, created the world. And God is sovereign, that is, thus he created all things, not influenced by anyone, but according to his own free will. The early church thus appealed to divine aseity, or that is, God's self-sufficiency or independence, omnipotence, wisdom, and sovereignty in its affirmation of creation ex nihilo. Biblically, the silence of scripture on how God created the heavens and the earth implies, implied creation ex nihilo, noting that Genesis 1, whenever anything is made out of anything, the Holy Spirit mentions both the thing that is made and the thing of which it is, be, it is made. Tertullian, one of the church fathers, concluded, God, when producing other things out of things which had been already made, indicates them by the prophet, and tells us, that is Moses, and tells us what he has produced from such and such a source. If the Holy Spirit took upon himself so great a concern for our instruction that we might know f of, from what everything was produced, would he not in like manner have kept us well informed about both the heaven and the earth by indicating for us what it was that he made them of if their original consisted of any material substance. He confirms by the silence of our assertion that they were produced out of nothing. And in case you want to look it up in the original Latin, that out of nothing is literally ex nihilo. In the beginning then, God made the heaven and the earth. Furthermore, Christian writers often affirm, though never put into creedal confession, that this creation out of nothing took place in six literal days in the not too distant past. Now, <clears throat> that seems to take sides in our, in our uh, truce, but whatever. For example, Methodius affirmed that God created heaven and earth and the things that are in them in six days. 
and that the creation of the world in six days was still recent. Though not all early Christians interpreted Genesis 1 literally, Origen, for example, did not. Origen is virtually the only example that did not. Um, I guess uh, Origen and Augustine, I guess they're the only two examples I can give you. Most did. Taking the six days of creation is also indicative of how long the created world would exist. <coughs> Relying on the biblical phrase, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years, Irenaeus calculated in as many days as this world was made, in so many thousand years it shall be concluded. For the day of the Lord is as a thousand years, and, it, and in six days created things were completed. It is evident, therefore, that they will come to an end at the six thousandth year mark. This was, of course, written um, in time so that uh, 500 A.D. would have been near 6,000 years for uh, the Septuagint chronology. For, from this reasoning, many in the early church considered the creation to be not very old, having taken place in the not-too-distant past. This doctrine of creation formulated within this biblical theological framework was set in opposition to several prevailing philosophical theories that challenged the belief. Important for our discussion was the challenge of the atomic theory. This was the th view that all life had originated by the chance collision of atoms in the unlimited void of the universe. Of course, they're not talking about the atoms that we know. These are literally atomos. You can't cut them. Um, Origen described Celsus' version of this theory as affirming. This is Contra Celsum, of course. Um, a certain fortuitous concurrence, an accidental collision, of atoms gave birth to qual qualities so diverse that it was owing or due to chance that so many kinds of plants, trees, and herbs resemble one another that no disposing reason, specifically the infinite mind of God, gave existence to them and that they do not derive their origin from an understanding that is beyond all admiration which sounds kind of familiar. This atomic theory postulated that the accidental collision of small elements resulted in the world as it is today, completely apart from the infinite mind of God, directing those atoms. The early church stood firmly against this theory. We Christians, however, who are devoted to the worship of the only God who created these things, feel grateful to, for them to him who made them. This atomic theory that the church rejected bears striking similarities to some aspects of contemporary theistic evolution theories and also atheistic evolution theories. From this brief survey of the early church's development of its doctrine of creation, several themes stand out. One, there is only one God who alone is eternal, self-sufficient, omnipotent, wise, and sovereign. This affirmation con contradicts the idea of the eternality of matter. To this God created the universe and everything in it out of nothing. Scripture at least implies creation ex nihilo. The extensiveness of the divine creation is all-encompassing. All visible things, including the sun, moon, stars, land, seas, trees, fish, birds, animals, and human beings, and all invisible things, like the angelic realm. Divine creation took place in six literal days in the not-too-distant past. <clears throat> The notion of an undirected process, a random collision of already existing elements fortuitously resulting in the origin and development of the vast diversity of living beings currently in existence was strongly denounced and considered absurd. This was the doctrine of creation that the early Christians embraced and defended. It was enshrined in the first article of one of its earliest and most widely influential creeds, popularly known as the Nicene Creed maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible. But there is more. Another important aspect of this creed is what its second artif article affirms. It expressed belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, by whom all things were made, who for us men and our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and of the Virgin Mary, and made man was crucified, suffered, and was buried, rose again, and ascended into heaven, and shall come again. Formulated against the Arian heresy, which denied the divinity of the second person of the Trinity, this article offered a compelling evidence, offered compelling evidence for the Son's deity, his role as agent in the creation of the world. 
as creator along with the Father, the Son is fully God, as is the Father. Moreover, the Son's work of creation and his work of salvation go hand in hand. As creator of the universe and savior of humanity, the Son is fully God. The creator-savior link is crucial. The one who became incarnate to save the world was none other than the one who created the world in the first place. Thus the church warned, a man is altogether irreligious and a stranger to the truth if he does not say that Christ the Savior is also the maker of all things. Accordingly, to the above summary of the early church's doctrine of creation is added, the creation of the world and all things in it is evidence for the deity of the Son of God, whose work of creation and work of salvation are linked together. The Creator is also the Savior, and vice versa. Thus the early church affirmed that God the Father created out of nothing the heavens and the earth, and all things visible and invisible, through God the Son in six, in six days a few thousand years ago. In addition to the doctrine of creation, the early church affirmed its belief in divine providence, or God's continued operation, continuous operation in, to sustain in existence and direct everything that he created. Divine providence applies to the physical universe, as Clement of Rome affirmed. The heavens move at God's direction and obey him in peace. Day and night complete the course assigned by him, neither hindering the other. The sun and the moon and the choirs of stars circle in harmony within the courses assigned to them, according to his direction, without any deviation at all. The seasons, spring and summer, and autumn and winter give way in succession, one to the other, in peace. The same providence applies to the angelic and human realms. I'm going to skip over what Origen has to say because it's pretty standard. Thus, the <clears throat> early church affirmed both God's creation of all things visible and invisible and his providential sustaining and ordering of the creation. But it never collapsed or confused these two divine works as is, is the case of some contemporary versions of theistic evolution. The later Catholic and Protestant development of the doctrinal standards on creation. The doctrine of creation along with the doctrine of providence continued to be the belief of the church in the medieval area and in the Reformation and post-Reformation periods. Additions to this basic framework included the role of the Holy Spirit in the work of creation, continually continuing the rejection of theories that creation came about by chance, ongoing affirmation of exhausting, exhaustive divine providence, strengthening the biblical basis for creation ex nihilo, and application of the doctrine in terms of proper use of humans of created things. Uh, quoting Thomas Aquinas, some have supposed that although creation is a proper act of the universal cause, namely God, Still, some inferior cause acting by the power of the first cause can create. And thus, Avicenna, a philosopher, asserted that the first separate substance created by God created another after itself, and the substance of the world and its soul, and that the substance of the world created a matter of inferior bodies, or creatures. And in the same manner, <coughs> Peter Lombard says, that God can communicate to a creature the power of creating so that the latter can create ministerially, not by its own power. Aquinas rejected this idea because the on, only the first cause, God, as absolute being, possesses the, power, possesses the power of creating, which is impossible for created things. His position stands against theistic evolution views that attribute creative power to matter in its development by purely natural processes. In the Protestant churches after the Reformation, while the confessions of faith and catechisms carefully articulated the many differences between Protestant doctrines and the Roman Catholic doctrines, for example, scripture and tradition, justification, Mary, etc., the doctrine of creation and providence was not one of those fault lines. The Augsburg Confession of Faith, the Heidelberg Catechism, and the Second Helvetic Confession, for example, briefly restate the traditional view, which was not a matter of controversy. At the same time, these Protestant confessions and catechisms expanded to include specific affirmations not previously incorporated into the church's doctrinal standards, although they may have been believed. These detailed confessional elements included angels, Adam and Eve, the fall, original sin, death, and more about divine providence. 
the creation of angelic and human beings, to the general profession of divine creation of all things, Protestant doctrinal standards added details about the types of created beings. The Belgic Confession of Faith, for example, affirmed, We believe that the Father, by the word, that is, by his Son, has created of nothing the heaven, the earth, and all creatures, as it seemed good unto him, giving unto every creature its being, shape, form, and several offices to serve its creator. He also created the angels good. We believe that God created man out of the dust of the earth, made and formed him after his own image and likeness, good, righteous, and holy, capable in all things to will agreeably to the will of God. Similarly, the Westminster Confession of Faith expressed the historical doctrine. It, is, it pleased God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the beginning to create or make of nothing the world and all things therein, whether visible or invisible, in the space of six days, and all very good. It continued, After God had made all other creatures, he created man, male and female, with reasonable and immortal souls, endued with knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness after his own image, having the law of God written in their hearts and power to fulfill it, and yet under the, a possibility of transgressing, being left to the liberty of their own will, which was subject unto change. Besides this law written in their hearts, they received a command not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which they kept, while they kept, they were happy in their communion with God and had dominion over the creatures. Sounds very, very much like Genesis 1 and 2. This doctrinal standard specifies belief in God's creation of Adam and Eve in the divine image as complex moral beings consisting of both body and soul and endowed with a sense of right and wrong who were created righteous and holy and given the responsibility to obey the Edenic command. Many advocates of theistic evolution do not affirm these beliefs about Adam and Eve. The creation of Adam and Eve versus the pre-Adamite theory. The post-reformers were even more specific about the beginning of the human race as a divine act, affirming the creation of Adam and Eve as the first human beings and as the progenitors of the entire human race. This declaration was necessary as a response to the pre-Adamite theory, first articulated in 1655 through 1656 by Isaac Le Pereri, my uh, French is not as good as it should be, in his pre-Adamite and men before Adam. His theory asserted that Adam was not the first human being created by God, but the first person of the Jewish people. Indeed, he claimed that the Gentiles existed long before Adam in the Jewish race. The Gentiles are diverse from the Jews in race and origin. The Jews were formed by God in Adam. The Gentiles were created before on the same day as other animate beings. The origin of the latter, that is the Gentiles, is described in Genesis 1, that of the former, the Jews, in Genesis 2. Gentiles are many ages before the Jewish nation and by race and nature diverse from the same and survivors of the Noachian flood of the Jews. Accordingly, the epoch of the creation of the world should not be dated from that beginning, which is commonly imagined at Adam, but must be sought for still further back from ages very remote in the past. That, of course, would be very convenient if one is uh, trying to fit evolution into this theory. Um, but it was obviously uh, given as a theory before evolution became important um, or even uh, articulated well. The post-reformers vigorously refuted this pre-Adamite theory. Positively, the influential Lutheran theologian John uh, Quinstead explained, Adam framed by God on the sixth day of the first hexahemeron, that's simply Greek for six days, is the first of all men and the parent of the entire human race throughout the whole globe. And it gives biblical support and you can pretty much imagine what that would be. Further support was the quote, constant opinion thus far not only among the Christians but also among the Jews yea, even among the Mohammedans themselves, that Adam was created in the beginning of the world and was the first man, the father not only of the Jews, but also of all men universally. Uh, negatively, the pre-Adamite pre theory was critiqued from several angles. First, Reformed theologian Francis Turretin argued, 
If innumerable men had been created before Adam, there would have been no need of a repeated creation of men from the dust, since ordinary generation would have been abundantly sufficient. And it cannot be said that there could not have been found for man a help me, that is a helper, for example, that is Eve, similar to himself if myriads of women already existed, nor would man have been alone, as is said in Genesis 2.18. Second, the theory failed in regard to the first woman created Eve, so named because she was the mother of all living, according to Genesis 3.20, which would be untrue if only the Jewish nation sprang from her. Thus, the leading theologians of the church had a ready answer to Le Pierre's um, pre-Adamite theory, and they, pre, they defended the traditional view that Adam and Eve were the parents of the entire human race. The relationship between creation, death, and the fall. In its wrestling with this wrong view, the church also had to face another issue regarding natural death before Adam and Eve's fall into sin, which, of course, would be required. Uh, Le Pereri had made a distinction between natural sin and death on the one hand and legal sin and death on the other, which is an interesting way of distinguishing. The former existed among the Gentile pre-Adamites who were liable to sin and natural death from their innate, corruptible, and moral nature. The latter was introduced only after Adam and Eve, to whom God had given the prohibition in the Garden of Eden, disobeyed that law, thus falling into legal sin and death. Turretin roundly denounced Le Pereri's novel idea. Sin cannot be called natural without impinging on God himself, the author of nature, nor ought death to be called natural, as if man was necessarily to die, even if he had not sinned. False also is the pretense that there can be any sin which is not against law, since it is nothing else than lawlessness, anomia. You remember First John, famous text. It is also false that there can be a death which is not le legal, since from no other source than from the power of the law and it, by its sanction was it ordained that man should die once. Accordingly, the reformers and post-reformers emphasized the origination of the human race with Adam and Eve and their tragic fall into sin. To this was added the belief that original sin is passed down from Adam to Eve and Eve to their posterity, the entirety of the human race. Not only were Adam and Eve the first human beings, they were also those whose disobedience wreaked havoc for all human beings after them. The Belgic Confession exemplifies this doctrinal standard. It treats, first treats Adam's disobedience to the Edenic law. The commandment of life which he had received, he transgressed, and by the sin separated himself, by sin separated himself from God, who was his true life, having corrupted his whole nature whereby he made himself liable to corporal and spiritual death. And being thus became, being thus become wicked, perverse, and corrupt in all his ways, he has lost all his excellent gifts. It then addresses original sin. Through the disobedience of Adam, original sin is extended to all mankind, which is a corruption of the whole nature and a hereditary disease wherewith infants themselves are infected even in their mother's womb and which produces in man all sorts of sin, being him, in him a, as a root thereof, and therefore is so vile and abominable in the sight of God that it is sufficient to condemn all mankind. Similar, the, the, the Westminster Confession of Faith. By this sin, they fell from their original righteousness and communion with God, and so became dead in sin and wholly defiled in all the parts and faculties of soul and body, they being the root of all mankind, the guilt of this sin was imputed, and the same death in sin and corrupted nature conveyed to all their posterity, descending from them by ordinary generation. The Lutheran theologians concurred with David Friedrich's Hollas representing their view. We will not bore you with a similar comment. Accordingly, the post-Reformation Protestant Church insisted on the introduction of both sin and death into the originally good creation through Adam and Eve and the transmission of original sin from them to their progeny, all subsequent human beings. This position refutes a view similar to the theistic evolution proposed by John Walton that prior to Adam and Eve, human beings were com committing sinful deeds and were dying, but they were 
not being held accountable for their sins. The creation and divine providence. Like the early church and the medieval church, Protestant churches continued to affirm God's ongoing providential care of all that he created, yet the act of initial creation and subsequent providential care were continually distinguished. Thomas Aquinas earlier had formulated the basic idea of divine government or God's rulership and the direction of the creation in accordance with his eternal purpose. In government, there are two things to be considered, the design of government, which is providence itself, and the execution of the design. As to the design of government, God governs all things immediately, whereas in its execution he governs some things by the means of others. The Westminster Confession of Faith continued this idea. The Belgian Confession emphasizes the comfort supplied by such providence. We believe that the same God, after he had created all things, did not fors forsake them or give them up to fortune or chance, but that he rules and governs them according to his holy will, so that nothing happens in this world without his appointment. This doctrine affords us unspeakable consolation since we are taught thereby that nothing can befall us by chance but by the direction of our most gracious and heavenly Father who watches over us with a paternal care keeping all creatures so under his power that not a hair of our head for they are not all numbered not a, nor a sparrow can fall to the ground without the will of our Father in whom we do entirely trust being persuaded that he so restrains the devil and all our enemies that without his will and permission they cannot hurt us. And therefore we reject that damnable error of the Epicureans who say that God regards nothing but leaves all things to chance. In this way, divine providence by which God sustains in existence everything that he created and directs all things towards his eternal goal was given detailed attention in the Reformation and post-Reformation period. But in contrast to contemporary theories of theistic evolution, this providential work by, of God by which he maintains the properties of all created things was never confused with or used as the explanation for the initial work of God in creating all things. With these details spelled out, it is now possible to summarize the Protestant doctrinal standards as specifying belief in the following tenets. The one, God created ex nihilo, all things in heaven and earth, both visible and invisible, including human beings in the divine image and angels. Two, Adam and Eve were created as the first human beings and as the progenitors of the entire human race. Three, as originally created, Adam and Eve were upright moral beings governed by the identical command and charged with the responsibility to exercise dominion over the rest of the created order. Four, by disobeying this identical command, they fell into sin. Adam and Eve became guilty before God and thoroughly corrupted in nature, and their punishment included both spiritual and physical death, the first incidence of such death in the human race. Five, because of solidarity with Adam and Eve, their progeny, each and every member of the human race, enters into life loaded down with guilt and, with guilt and characterized by corruption of nature. This is the state of original sin. Six, not only did, uh, did God initially create all things in heaven and earth, both visible and invisible, he also exercises providential care and control over all created things. Such meticulous, exhaustive providence does not allow for randomness, accident, chance, fortune, luck, and fate. On the contrary, while using secondary means to accomplish his eternal purpose, God directs all things, all created things teleologically, ruling out all notions of undirected processes at work in this world. C, contemporary doctrinal standards of creation. On creation. Ever since the outset of the modern period, the doctrinal standards that have been widely, if not unanimously, held by churches have come under fierce attack. The doctrine of creation is no exception. Indeed, it can be argued that this belief has been the target of extreme criticism. Many, moreover, many churches and denominations that have formulated or reformulated their doctrinal standards in the modern period have expressed their belief without great detail. Again, the doctrine of creation exemplifies this trend. It means that the doctrinal standards about creation of many contemporary churches and denominations are very basic affirmations if they even appear. For example, the Baptist faith and message of the Southern Baptist Con Convention which states that God is a creator, redeemer, pres uh, preserver, and ruler of the universe, expresses its belief about God the Father. 
God as Father reigns in, with providential care over his universe, his creatures, and the flow of, of the stream of human history according to the purposes of his grace. Kind of vague. This doctrinal statement also affirms a basic belief in the special creation of human beings as divine image bearers and their fall into sin, which would seem to preclude the kind of theistic evolution that uh, this book is writing against. The foundational doctrines of the United Methodist Church with the Evangelical United Brethren are similarly brief. They, they mention the Assemblies of God if you're interested in the details, which aren't very many. You look in the book, the Evangelical Free Church, the Evangelical Covenant Church does not address the doctrine of creation, nor does the United Church of Christ. Exceptions to this trend are found. For example, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod has an explicit statement affirming the traditional doctrinal standard on creation and reputing evolutionary theory. We teach that God has created heaven and earth and in the manner and in the space of time recorded in the Holy Scriptures, especially Genesis 1 and 2, namely by his almighty creative word, and in six days. Not six 24-hour consecutive days, but whatever. Um, we reject every doctrine which denies or limits the work of creation as taught in Scripture. In our days, it is denied or limited by those who assert, ostensibly in deference to science, that the world came into existence through a process of evolution, that is, that it has in immense periods of time developed more or less of itself. Since no man was present when it pleased God to create the world, <clears throat> we must look for a reliable account of creation to God's own record found in God's own book, the Bible. We accept God's own record with full confidence and confess with Luther's, Luther's catechism, I believe that God has made me and all creatures. It sounds pretty strongly short-age creationist. This Lutheran statement continues with a denial of an evolutionary development of human beings. Another exception is the Presbyterian Church of America, which has the Westminster Confession of Faith for its doctrinal standards on creation, providence, Adam and Eve, the fall, and sin. With this amount of variation among churches and denominations, it is difficult to generalize about the compatibility or incompatibility of theistic evolution with doctrinal standards throughout the Protestant churches or even evangelical Protestant churches. This chapter's approach, however, which considers the, this matter from the historical position of the church, finds that theistic evolution is imp incompatible with all the historical doctrinal standards that address these specific questions. The incompatibility of theistic evolution with the church's doctrinal standards. The incompatibility of these doctrinal standards and theistic evolution, the view that God created matter, and after it did not guide or intervene to cause any empirically detectable change in the natural behavior of matter until all living things had evolved by purely natural processes can be demonstrated in three points. One with three subpoints. One, theistic evolution's affirmation that God created matter is in itself neither wrong nor controversial, but that it but it does not go far enough. Such a view falls short of affirming as the church has historically believed that God created not only inanimate matter, but also all visible things, including the sun, moon, stars, land, seas, trees, fish, birds, animals, and human beings. Skipping on to two, theistic evolution's view that after creating matter, God did not guide or intervene to cause any de empirically detectable change in the natural behavior of matter is in clear conflict with the church's historical position. It must be noted that only some of the varieties of theistic evolution deny that the process was directed. Other types of theistic evolution, like that of Francis Collins, and I would have to say Ken, uh, uh, Kenneth Miller as well, do not specify the nature of the evolutionary process, whether it is un undirected or directed. In both cases, however, the idea of an undirected evolutionary process that produces no detectable change in what exists encounters three problems with the church's doctrinal standards, and here they are. First, the early church clearly denounced the idea of an undirected process by which the universe and everything in it came into existence. The church has traditionally considered as absurd the notion that random collisions of existing elements fortuitously resulted in the development of what it currently exists. Through the atomic theory, 
against which the early church argued in the contemporary theory of theistic evolution, pardon me, though they are, uh, not the same theory, the basic tenet that some type of natural process acted on random variation to unexpectedly produce what exists today is at the heart of both theories. The church's denunciation of the basic tenet of the earlier theory would seem to carry over to the contemporary theory. Second, the concept of the universe developing by means of an undirected process like natural selection acting on random mutations does not provide support for the deity of Jesus Christ as proved by his creation of all things visible and invisible whom the church has historically proclaimed to be both savior and creator. The church has repeatedly affirmed that Christ's work of creation furnishes proof of his divine nature. Third, the concept of the universe developing by means of an undirected process that does not give evidence of divine activity contradicts the church's historical position based on scripture, for example, Romans 1, 18 through 25, that God's creative handiwork reveals and prompts praise for his power, divinity, care, omniscience, sovereignty, wisdom, goodness, and kindness. And I might add, is ignored deliberately. Three, theistic evolutions view that after creating matter, God did not guide or intervene in the development of that matter until all living things had evolved by purely natural processes. Is at odds with the church's doctrinal standards for several reasons. First, this view introduces an internal inconsistency in the church's historical position that God has created not only the visible realm, but the invisible as well. So as you've created angels, then why not creating creatures uh, that are visible? Second, and more significantly, the view of the evolution of the world by purely natural processes stand in contrast with the church's doctrinal standards that God created Adam and Eve as the first human beings and the progenitors of the whole human race. And it goes on to talk about pre-Adamite view, natural death in the human realm, and original sin. What about evangelical leaders who affirm theistic evolution? What then should we make of pastors and other Christian leaders who embrace or embraced theistic evolution? The following citations from several leaders are representative. John Stott sought to wed belief in a literal Adam and Eve with some form of theistic evolution, which is too bad because he's otherwise quite good. Um, Tim Keller, uh, Derek Kidner's Genesis, and of course, C.S. Lewis. Uh, and finally, Princeton theologian B.B. Warfield, with whom we will discuss uh, next week. What is to be made of the views of these Christian pastors and leaders? None of them explicitly embrace theistic evolution as this book defined it. The view that God created matter and after that did not guide or intervene to cause any empirically detectable change in the natural behavior of matter until all living things had evolved by purely natural processes. Indeed, at least some of them gave evidence of confusion over the nature of theistic evolution and or expressed hesitation about it. Additionally, none of them denied that Adam and Eve were created in the image of God, that Adam and Eve were originally sinless, and all human beings have descended from Adam and Eve, and that human death began as a result of Adam's sin. Skipping on, conclusion. In summary, theistic evolution encounters numerous obstacles. The previous chapters in this book have enumerated these problems, logical contradictions, convoluted and scientifically vacuous explanations, biblical misinterpretations, and the like. The focus of this chapter has been on theistic evolution being incompatible with doctrinal standards required for church leadership as those doctrinal standards have been developed throughout church history. Please note what this chapter does not do. It does not demonstrate or imply that Christian leaders who embrace theistic evolution are not or cannot be true disciples of Jesus Christ. But this chapter does show that Christian leaders who hold to, on to theistic evolution stand outside the church's historical position. Now, my own take on that is that Greg Allison demonstrates that the historical position of the church until quite recent times was conservative. In this respect, the church mirrored the New Testament attitude to the creation story. I think the church was exposed to some, particularly the Epicureans and Le Prairie, who made arguments very similar to those of modern theistic evolutionists. 
This is one place where the implications of what is said in the book seems to favor not just intelligent design, but actually a short age for creation, including the sixth literal day aspect. It is interesting that the chapter made it through the editorial process. Perhaps the six-day arguments are strong enough and connected enough to the rest of the material that they could not easily be omitted. Otherwise, one might have expected them to be omitted. Notice that the modern statements are more watered down and can accommodate theistic evolutionists, at least some of them, um, and old life creationists, for that matter, more easily. What is really happening here is that the 600-pound gorilla is being accommodated by theistic evolutionists and, to a lesser extent, by old life creationists. We must accept evolution, or at least the standard geologic time scale. And therefore, you do whatever adjustments you have to to make it work. That is why the first chapters on science especially, but also on philosophy, are so important. See. Once one realizes that the 600-pound gorilla need not be accommodated, one can recognize that it wreaks havoc on theology. If you try the reverse, people simply say, well, the theology is no good and give up on everything. This book is important for helping to destroy the perception that undirected processes can create the universe we see. A follow-up argumentation can be made that the time scale is susceptible to those same kinds of criticism. For example, erosion rates, paraconformities, and especially combined with soft sediment deformation, dinosaur soft tissue and ancient life, carbon-14 in ancient material, and I might add beryllium-10 as well, genetic entropy, and finally, I think that the uh, argument of mitochondria and the Eve and uh, Y chromosome atom uh, argue very strongly for uh, a short age for human life and that, uh, in fact, uh, if you extend that to mitochondrial barcodes, it looks like perhaps all of life can be argued for in that same way. But that's my opinion. <coughs> now it's your turn. Go ahead. Uh, just to add to your... Um mention of the Lutheran Missouri Synod. I believe it was about four weeks ago in their annual, annual, no, it was a multi-annual meeting, or a great big meeting. They uh, reaffirmed their belief in a recent six-day creation and initiated a new emphasis on promulgating that position, especially among the young people, uh, education and so on. And in other words, they were serious about it and doing something about this issue, uh, promoting a six-day creation. Well, which group was that again? Missouri Synod. Oh, okay. So they're maintaining... Oh, yeah, like I agree. Very strong, you know, really synod of the Lutheran Church. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Other comments? We left you all stunned here. <laughs> okay, just a minute. Mike's coming. Some of the uh, theistic evolutionists have no problem believing in the gospel, even though they put Genesis, uh, almost the whole book, maybe 1 through 11, uh, you know, what would you call it? Not fairy tale, but they don't believe it was literal. Do you know how they can believe in the gospel? and still ignore Genesis? Well, there's two questions there, and I'll have to distinguish that. Uh, people can believe all kinds of things. 
some of which will be incompatible with others. So that uh, you can kind of by force of will uh, just simply affirm things that, uh, that don't make sense together. Um, so in that sense, I can, I can say, I can understand how they could believe it, but I, I guess I am not sure how you can make coherent sense of both the propositions that you mentioned. Um, and I don't know whether they can explain that either, but we will see. Anyway, back to... Uh, Perhaps the reason for our silence is that it's hard to contradict scriptural statements. There it is, take it or leave it. But there are still details that are disputable. When God created the earth and the universe, for instance, what's the universe and where is the, uh, the gap? Well, I'll just uh, reiterate uh, the issue that <clears throat> isn't mentioned in the chapter, of course. And uh, th This book's a peculiar thing in a way. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the time issue is, is so basic to this whole thing here. And... Uh, <clears throat> That's what uh, people are afraid to touch. And uh, I'll admit it, it is not an easy thing to touch in a way. Because, uh, we, we know uniformitarianism, well, we don't see much happening right now, but, uh, and so on, but uh, certainly a tremendous evidence for catastrophe really before. Uh, and... Uh, you have to move out of the uh, out of the uh, idea of unchanging rates of change uh, to to get into uh, something that you, that can accommodate uh, uh, what what uh, at least the Bible requires and what data out there in nature seems to require uh, and uh, it's. It's easy to uh, try and escape that issue that you have to face. Well, the thing about uniformitarianism is it's actually been dead for a long time. Uh, I mean, not that it doesn't, its corpse kind of keeps walking along. Sure. Uh, but, but, for example, nobody anymore believes that... Uh, slow rates of erosion created the Grand Coulee, for example. You can argue whether it's one or 20 floods or 100 floods, but nobody's going to advocate for a zero floods and a slow erosion, of, you know. That's just, that won't fly. And, uh, uh, I mean, we're seeing more and more of this kind of thing where people are discovering that that the idea of slow deposition just won't wash. And, you know, if you think about it, vast uh, deposits of conglomerates obviously are not, de you know, dis deposited at the centimeter every thousand years. You know, when you've got cobbles that are bigger than a centimeter, that kind of argues for rapid deposition. And I think Derek Ager has the upper hand. And in fact, if it were not for the fear that this would degenerate into flood geology, I think that uh, uniformitarianism would not only be dead, but have been recognized as being dead for a long time. Sure, and uh, catastrophism is, you know, uh, neo-catastrophism, possible term that's used there, uh, 
and so on uh, is accepted you know catastrophes uh, uh, the idea that there weren't catastrophes which dominated uniformitarianism died the idea that there are catastrophes is accepted and tremendous amounts of time are put between these things to accommodate the long geodetical ages which means that every conformity is now transformed into a paraconformity. Yes. Uh, <laughs> very good point. Yes. And in this statement you made just a bit ago, <clears throat> I think your last sentence was, was a key item. In other words, yeah, okay, we'll recognize the catastrophes happen, but don't you dare extend your thinking to allow a short time or, or, or a Genesis flood. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, unif unif probably the word uniformitarianism is not so applicable, but, but, uh, but don't you dare allow a shortening of the time or, or, or anything like that. Well, when you realize that the founder, or at least the, well, the major exponent, so the one who went down in history is that way, talked about freeing the science from Moses, you suddenly realize that it's actually anti-biblical uh, uh, geology. And the attempt to try to fit anti-biblical geology with the Bible makes no sense. How, why do you expect that it's going to fit. Anyway, comment here. Uh, let's see, where's the closest mic, I guess? Well, it's been fascinating to listen and participate. Um, I think there's there are some very practical aspects of this whole discussion. Um, it's been for me, informative to observe the central church's attempt at different times to apply to different degrees the need to separate between believers who fully accept what the central church is ta teaching and those who are very effective practicing Adventist Christians but don't necessarily hold that hard and fast a degree. Uh, let me continue, having been in this for an awful long time. I think we, as a church, have, as a matter of practicality and survival, developed a two-track, at least a two-track approach, and that is... Uh, who should be an Adventist, first of all. But secondly, and perhaps at least as importantly, who should be participating in the discussion with our young people, which are the future of the church. And my own philosophy is really to track. Uh, we Would we formally involve educators in the Adventist system they they need to be chosen more carefully than the degree of difference one can have and still remain a functioning Adventist, if you get my, my point. Uh, it's been at times quite upsetting to me to find those who have the truth, in quotation marks, uh, insistent that anyone who calls themselves an Adventist must agree with that in its entirety. While I fully agree that those who present this, as I just said, I don't want to go on and on repeating myself, uh, to, to young people uh, need to be supportive of the, the six-day creation and all that implies with softer 
commitments to a particular scheme for flood, et cetera, et cetera. I guess that's saying enough. You know, and actually that's a, uh, that's a perennial problem, and as you can see from the book, it's not just an Adventist problem. Um, it looks like the uh, Missouri Synod of the Lutheran Church has decided to be kind of just exclusive and you know if you want uh, there are other Lutheran churches you can join that's one way of dealing with it um, there's there are other ones that don't want to say too much because if they do, then they silence certain voices that they prefer to have. Um, as I understand it, uh, William Dembski, who is long age, is teaching at Southern Baptist, uh, which implies that he's good enough to make the the first class um, uh, rank in, in that denomination. Um, And when I was at Glacier View, one of the things we were able to do is to get acquainted with a number of people who are otherwise just, you know, paper presences, so to speak. Um, and one of the uh, people I got acquainted with who is actually presenting opposite me, and interestingly, appears not to have read the paper I wrote at all. Uh, in spite of the fact that he was supposed to be opposite me, but um, wrote or, or was complaining very bitterly that he felt like a second-class citizen. So while your solution may be the right one, I don't know, uh, it certainly is not one without its own drawbacks. I mean, there isn't a perfect solution. <laughs> uh, you mentioned Glacier View. I was involved in organizing uh, those sessions. And one presentation really has stuck with me, and that was an Adventist geology who was working in the government organized ge geology. Uh, gave a presentation titled, and this isn't quite, well, you get the gist, From Uninformed Certainty. To informed uncertainty as he found his college level training no problem didn't survive his training later training as a geologist but this man I knew and had looked into it was one of the most active Adventists at the local church level and in evangelism etc so he to me became sort of the poster for these conflicts. Now there was one other thing that I found very striking, although most of it, people made their presentations and they didn't really move too much. One thing that did come out very clearly afterwards, the, the theologians, believe it or not, actually tried to prepare statements that they believed to be consensus statements even with people with different views. And one of them was that the Bible author, and they deliberately kept it vague because you know you could argue whether it was Moses or not, um, but the Bible author believed that he was describing a short, uh, a literal, six literal day creation a few thousand years ago. which I thought was an advance. What it means is that if you're going to go long age, you're going to have to challenge the self-understanding of that Bible writer. That all of this, oh, they really didn't mean it, is window dressing and a bunch of, um, well, it's window dressing of a particularly opaque kind. Um, that in fact the biblical author did believe that he was talking about six days and six literal days and 24 hour days and the kind of days that we normally 
uh, say. And that what we are doing if we disagree is we are either reinterpreting him knowing that we are reinterpreting um, that in a way that he would not accept at least initially and then uh, or we can simply accept what he has to say and then and then go from there uh, I think that that choice it is too bad that it didn't get out of Glacier View because that would clarify the issue no, this is not an issue of biblical interpretation. This is an issue of, I know what the Bible writer meant, I just don't believe it. You know, that, that was an interesting comment. I, uh, uh, the biology group at Glacier View came up with a fairly lengthy document uh, looking to the future that I personally was very comfortable with and it seemed like it would have been a positive contribution. Well, it was particularly discouraging to all of us to put a great deal of time on that. The, the next and final meeting of that series uh, totally ignored those outcomes. They had not, never happened. Yeah. And went on on a path that a very small group of, of uh, informed Adventists were comfortable with. I think that it would have been helpful if people. I, I, I'm not saying they needed to hear all of the ins and outs of everything, but at least, of course. at least the consensus statements I think should have come out. Anyway, we comment back there. Uh, we reject the evolutionary view that uh, everything is random. Uh, God is not involved at all. Uh, but yet, we do not see, I don't think we see randomness in uh, an earthquake or a flood or a tornado. We don't say God did this so that God was involved as some evangelicals do. They say God is in absolute control and nothing happens without his direct involvement. So uh, how do we uh, decide where we are? Are we halfway between those two views? Are we, are we saying that, yes, God is involved in nature, or is he not? Um, well, I can give you my perspective on it, and then uh, I guess uh, that's open to challenge, too. But when, when the book of Job was written, it's written from a perspective that everything is under God's control and that even horribly bad things uh, are something that he... Uh, has the power to stop and does not stop and in fact actively participates in uh, you may remember the opening scene where uh, Satan comes up uh, in the meeting of the sons of God and said and uh, and uh, God says where are you from and he says uh, from walking around the earth and uh, going to and fro in it. Uh, this, by the way, is the typical description of somebody who's king. And so basically while he's saying that he's been go walking around the earth, he's saying, I own the place. And God says, not so fast. Um, have you considered my servant Job? And of course the devil's response to that is, he just serves you for the money. You take that away, he'll curse you to his face, to your face. And so God, uh, notice how the devil says, you take it away. 
And then God says to the devil, well, he is in your power, only you can't touch his person. So God implies that the devil's going to do it. The devil implies that God should do it. And you find out exactly how God views this when the second meeting takes place, which is, have you observed my servant Job who maintains his... uh, I've forgotten exactly what word you use. In spite of the fact that you moved me to destroy him. So God does not extract himself out of that equation. He does put the blame on the devil for initiating it. But he does say that that God permitted it. In fact, God supported the devil's decision and that's a hard thing for us to say because God never does anything that could be conceived of as wrong but the fact of the matter is if you think of it supposing that you were to decide to shoot me and next time that you bring a gun okay and you know nobody's looking for it nobody cares and so you you know then in the middle of the sabbath school you pull out the gun i mean you can't do it now obviously because you don't have one but (laughs) and then you aim at me and you pull the trigger god has to sustain your life until next week god has to allow your brain to receive messages from your mind in my view but that's you know whether your brain and your mind are exactly the same we can debate but in any case your brain has to conceive of it and to decide to send messages to your index finger and your other fingers to aim and all those have to be coordinated and then you have to send messages down and then they have to hit your forearm muscles which will pull tendons which will pull the trigger which will move the lever all of that's God's doing without God none of that would happen then it has to move the lever up to the trip hammer which comes down and hits the uh, firing pin and then the bullet has to start moving in response to the you know This is all natural stuff, and it's all God's maintenance. And the bullet has to hit me, and it has to do whatever it's going to do. You know? And that's true whether you happen to hit me in the uh, eye, go into the brain, and instantly kill me, or it happens to miss, and it hits some, you know, the... uh, uh, thing that I'm wearing or it happens to move off because you're bad aim Um, all of that is done with the power of God we couldn't do anything without God's direct intervention what that means is that God as uh, the Cobes used to say has to support the program of evil And we've done a great job trying to develop a theology that will shield God from that. But the end result of that theology is God can't do anything and all this stuff happens by itself. That's the end result. And so the answer is, yeah, we are stuck with that. And I don't think we should pull earthquakes out of the equation The one thing that I will say is I can point the earthquakes back to man's bad decisions. And that's, and here's how. Very simply. Earthquakes, most of them are caused by uh, plate tectonics. Plate tectonics would not exist except for the flood. The flood would not exist except for man's evil actions towards other man and other creatures and the resulting reaction of nature that it all does go back to Adam's sin 
And that's the only way I can see that you can reasonably defend it. That we are responsible for all of the bad actions that happen. We and the devil is taking advantage of us. But the devil would never have control of the earth. He was confined to one tree until we gave him permission to have free reign. And he does now mostly own the place. Comment here, and then we have another one. I wanted to respond to something Jack said a little while ago about choosing teachers and having spent most of my life choosing, training, and educating teachers. I can tell you that that is an extremely complex endeavor. It's not, even when you're teaching kindergarten, it's not about how to cut out a better paper doll. And when you're teaching graduate students and to write a dissertation, it's not just about crafting words so that it passes the committee. All of these people are teaching the children of the church. Every single parent sends their child whether it's kindergarten or graduate school, to an Adventist institution because they trust us. And sometimes I say to myself, particularly for a college student or a graduate student, are they better off in the church where with great skill, a scientist or a theologian or a philosopher or an educator, can argue against the beliefs of the church so skillfully that they come out and they don't know where they stand? Or would they be better off to go to a secular institution where they could go home on the weekend and say to their parents, here's what I'm being taught, and the parent can say, yes, but. Here's what the Bible teaches. Here's why we believe what we believe. And give them something to stand upon fighting against a skillful educator is extremely difficult for a student. I don't I actually don't know how you could choose perfect teachers at whatever level. You know, we mentioned we should do it more carefully. You can't imagine how carefully we try to do that. And the requirements by the denomination for what they're taught and the requirements by the state for what they're taught and the thousands of pages we have to write in order to defend whatever we teach shows the complexity. And I think, I think we do a, a reasonable job, but we're fighting against great forces within and without the church to try to help young people to be able to know how to reason and think. I've heard lots of professors say, oh, we don't teach them what to think, we teach them how to think. That's a bunch of baloney. We teach them what to think no matter where they are in school, and we say to them, oh, we're teaching you how to think. No, you're not. If if you're teaching them how to think, let them say whatever they want on the final exam. They'll flunk because they don't always agree with you. We teach them how to regurgitate back to us what we say and what the textbook says. So I, I, I wish there was a perfect way for us to say, we're going to train kids in how to believe in God starting in kindergarten and as they graduate from in a doctoral program. But it's really, really tough. And then they go out and they teach whatever they want to anyway. Well, I think that it's fair to say that actually when you're teaching people what to think, you wind up teaching them how to think kind of either how to consciously think like or you. unconsciously anyway. How to think like you. Yeah. How to think for themselves is an incredibly complex thing to do because you're standing, as a student, you're standing up against very powerful professors. And if you don't think professors are powerful, look back to your own doctoral program. Which ones are the ones that you quote? Which ones are the ones that you think, I wonder if I could say this to Professor so-and-so? Well, if that even matters to you, you're probably not thinking on your own. And we have one comment here. (laughs) Uh, Wait just a minute. Let's, Let's get this. Okay. Does anybody in here know if there's a number we should call in regard to that alarm that keeps going off? 
I it's, can't hear it's it. Probably, you don't hear it. Uh, there's something wrong somewhere, and I don't know if it's important or who we should call. I, probably I mean, it's, call it's irritating, but that's a secondary issue, perhaps. Yeah, I'd probably call security. Yeah. Comment here. Oh, you've got one? Okay, go ahead and then we'll pass it down. Um, I like to look with a long yardstick, to quote my father, <laughs> at history. And it seems like this 6,000 years is just a little blip in eternity, although it doesn't feel that way to us. But I see God as supporting the will of human beings, whatever they choose to do, so that it will be seen that they are making their own choice as to whether to want to spend eternity with him being unselfish or not. And if that results in tectonic plates and floods and bullets um, he has to do that so that when we get to heaven during the millennium and sort this all out as the British would say using the word sort <laughs> um, we will be persuaded that by allowing sin to go to seed and seeing its full harvest nobody's going to ever want to go there again I think that's quite reasonable. And and that means that some of it's going to be painful when it's yes. happening. In this world, you will have tribulation. All of the 12 disciples were martyred. All of the saints in the Middle Ages were, <laughs> many of them, were martyred. And all of the people in the early Christian church suffered great deprivation and loss. This is not a, uh, what do they call it, <laughs> rice bowl Christianity religion. One more comment, and maybe we'll uh, call it a day after this. Just wanted to comment on the idea that there's no easy answer to this, and it, it almost comes down to having to think about where you are willing to accept collateral damage. Um, when it comes to the system, we have kids that are being influenced by professors, uh, there's collateral damage there when they get exposed to very powerful liberal arguments uh, that run contrary to the Bible. Uh, if you try to be accommodating to the, the liberal intelligentsia um, and, and avoid collateral damage there, then you're you know, making the damage worse on the side of those that are trying to learn. So it's... Um, it's almost like you have to decide where where are you willing to accept losses? Yeah. 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 I the the last thing I'll say is that I think that this chapter outlines that traditional Christianity is really on the side of uh, intelligent design advocates and in fact uh, although they don't say it, it's in the, on the side of short-age creationists. And uh, uh, I think that once you realize that, that, that science is not the monolith that, uh, that simply squashes all possible objections, at that point I think you can, uh, you can start to say, well, maybe we should give a conservative Christianity a better chance. Uh, but anyway, the next chapter is on B.B. Warfield, and it's, it's fascinating because B.B. Warfield was one of the stars of the fundamentalist movement. And that's why, uh, that's why theistic evolution is kind of like him, and that's why this book mentions him, because what they're going to show, or they're going to attempt to show, and you can see whether you buy it or not, is that he isn't really one of them. And then it will be interesting to make the discussion about why should we care about B.B. B. Warfield anyway? 
I think the same reason that we uh, we care about what C.S. Lewis had to say. And uh, we'll have more time with that, you know, that question is, is this the right way to settle an argument? And uh, I would maintain that in, a, in an important sense, E.B. Warfield is interesting but irrelevant to the entire project. And if all they do is pull him out of the relevancy for this spe specific set of questions, they have done the job they needed to. Um, I, I haven't decided yet, and I could be persuaded. And in fact, if you guys have a book that you would like to present, you are welcome to do so.